talking about continuous assessment, continue to provide that scoring and coverage. And then, like we're going to talk about specifically in this presentation, bringing your own security data lake. Whether you have all that data centralized or whether it's spread across, you don't have to move it in order to be uh, effective in, in doing security across all that data. All right, so again, another representation of the platform, starting with the data where it lives, ingesting security alerts directly from vendor tools. We have our platform that provides, again, that co-pilot that's going to assist you in doing these necessary tasks and ultimately make it much easier to hunt, investigate, and deploy custom sequence-based detections. All right, so real quick on the architecture, I think this is important as we talk about the leaving data where it is. The data is gonna be over here in your logging platform that you likely already own and already have some data there. Whether that's Splunk, Snowflake, Azure, or a combination of all of those, what Anvilogic is going to do is to reach into those data repositories and search. We're gonna do that via API. We're gonna do that via the custom, or I'm sorry, the native search language of the tool. So we're not simply genericizing these searches. We're doing it very specific to take advantage of the features and uh, capabilities that are native to each of these platforms. When we find the interesting events, we're gonna tag, normalize, and enrich those. And then we're gonna put those into our events of interest index or table, basically a summary of these relevant events. It's gonna be tagged, normalized, and enriched, which is gonna be key for providing that cross repository correlation. And then we're able to take alerts and other interesting events directly from the vendor tools. We're doing the same sort of tagging process to add that MITRE ATT&CK tactic and technique. We're doing the same normalization to ensure that the fields are properly named. And those are in, ending up in the events of interest index alongside the detections from your uh, raw data style alerts. This then gives us the, the basis for doing the advanced correlation detection, doing hunting and running our machine learning algorithms against that data to provide those insights. Then we've got a variety of enrichments that can add data as it's coming into that events of interest index so that it has the necessary information. And then the output comes from the patterns or scenario-based correlations. So this is what's going to really tell you when an adversary is running their TTPs. And finally, that can be output to the case ticketing system of, of your choice. All right, so let's, let's kind of dive into a little bit, right? You don't have to re-ingest your data. One of the questions we often get at Able Logic is people say, do I need to move my data? Do I need to re-ingest it in somewhere? How does that work? Well, the short answer is you don't have to, right? You can leave it where it exists today. Now, if you're in the process of moving that data, that's fine. It's also very easy to move that around, and I'll show what I mean by that in terms of not sacrificing any of your security posture. But Anvilogic provides a very straightforward interface to connect into your data platform. So that's what uh, our wizard provides. And you know, if you wanna try that out, it's very easy for you to do that yourself. So what I'm gonna be talking about now is how we're doing the detection across the different repositories and how we're making basically the security posture aspect of it database agnostic, right? Or data repository agnostic. So for this particular example, we have a rule that is in our armory. This rule is titled Office, Spos Office Spawns Suspicious Child Process. I did not rehearse saying that three times fast, so that's why I stumbled. If you want to try that at home, I encourage it. But this particular rule is looking for, you know, a Microsoft Office program spawning a child process that, like the name says, is suspicious. Often one of the first steps of exploitation. If somebody clicks on a macro or enables some sort of code execution, this is what adversaries can use to get a hold in your environment. Now, key point here is you'll notice we have different versions of this rule. So the overall use case is staying the same, but the, the specific search language rule that we have will be provided for each data repository. In this case, Snowflake, Splunk, and Azure Sentinel. So if we look at the rule and I've expanded the particular Snowflake rule here, We'll be able to see some metadata on the left-hand side uh, for this rule. We'll also be able to see the search logic itself that what we're actually doing. A couple key things to notice here. We call out that this is specific to Snowflake. Again, I said we wrote this uh, to take advantage of the native capabilities there. So each of these rules is specifically designed for the platform in question. You'll notice that it mentions the data repository here as well. And then finally, the logic itself is going to be written in this case SQL, which is what Snowflake uses, obviously. We're looking for, in this case, you know, a particular parent process name or set of names, and then a particular process path that was spawned from that. 
So uh, similarly, right, we have the Splunk version of the rule. So this one, if we point out the same sort of arrows here, we see this logic written in SPL, and we see the data repository being Splunk. This logic itself, right, is going to be different. It's going to be looking for the same type of thing, but using Splunk processing language instead of SQL uh, search language. So again, looking for particular office programs with the suspicious child process, we do some additional uh, processing of the data. But at the end of the day, whether your Windows event logs live in, um, whether your Windows event logs, in this case, live in Snowflake, Splunk, or Azure, we have the same rule, the same security coverage, looking for the same MITRE attack techniques in all three of those environments. So if one day you start with the data coming into Splunk, for example, and you have this rule enabled, and you then migrated that data to Snowflake, it's as simple as enabling the alternate version of the rule, and you still retain that same coverage and same detection posture. So that gives us an advantage where our raw events can live in any of the three places. So with our framework, we're able to then cross-correlate, and that's kind of the next step of this, right? So you have the raw data, you're looking for interesting events, we're able to cross-correlate because again, all of our identifiers are funneling into our events of interest index. So when we find one of those um, office programs spawning a suspicious process, whether the data lived in Splunk, Snowflake, or Azure, it's all going to the same events of interest uh, location. That then enables us to run scenarios to really do true TTP detection on our normalized events of interest. And this becomes really exciting when we think about an example where you have some data in Splunk, some data in Snowflake, <clears throat> and you can realistically correlate across that in ways that are almost impossible without a framework like this. So in this example, I've got my Okta logs living in Snowflake. I've got my Windows event logs living in Splunk. The first stage of my detection scenario is going to be looking for maybe an authentication from a suspicious country or a user rejected an MFA push request. These are very common kind of precursors to um, a compromise for an account takeover or something of that effect. So what I'm looking for here is the same user. Now, again, this is coming from my Okta logs that are living in Snowflake, and my Windows event logs are looking for certain other activities that may be happening on an endpoint that the um, user is, is operating on. So if I see the correlation of the same user, I've already normalized these two different data sources that are coming from two different domains I've put them into the same normalized repository, and now I'm able to effectively correlate this interesting scenario that could be the steps of an attack, even though my raw logs live in two different places. So it's a very powerful framework that gives us the ability to look across fields like a user, all other ways we can correlate is across a host, an IP address, a domain, but we were able to take these specific things that we detect and find when they occur in proximity with one another um, on the same user in this case. So another way to think of that in a more generic sense is we're doing multi-stage detections and there are frankly a bunch of different possibilities, but we try to make it simpler for you by um, building pre-built scenarios that correspond to adversary behavior. And we publish those as part of our armory. So for example, like a threat identifier, again, generically is looking for something very specific, maybe a certain event ID and a process name, all of those identifiers end up in events of interest, and then scenarios are what look across those different events of interest for correlation of a particular entity, like a user or host within specified timeframes. And that gives us very powerful correlation. So with that, that's basically the end of what I was gonna talk about here in terms of leaving your data where it lived, or leaving your data where it exists. Um, but I encourage you to come check out more about our ARML seems to be one of the uh, top questions I've been getting here at Black Hat is what do you do with AI? So to answer that question, come back and check out one of our follow-on sessions. Thank you all for listening. If you want to take a test drive, go check out uh, ambilogic.com slash test drive.